He's a good guy. And I'll just make another uh, little comment about Mike Hutchings. Uh, amazing, amazing results that he has seen. He's part of Randy Clark's ministry. So that means they do a lot of conferences every year all around the world. And the testimonies, um, there's one actually posted on our YouTube channel of a, of a soldier of uh, post-traumatic stress, lost all the feeling in, in his, his nerves. He couldn't use his left hand. It was just an amazing testimony of how he just showed up at a Randy Clark meeting and um, you know, couldn't even be around a lot of other people because that was part of the trauma he was experiencing. And he fought through it and he went down and, and Randy pr prayed for him. Um, and over the course of three days, he went from being almost completely disabled from the trauma to being completely healed from the trauma. And one of the things that, if you watch this video, you'll, uh, that's right in the name, PTSD Healed, um, if you're looking on our YouTube channel. He said one of the things was that Mike Hutchings was the one praying for him at the front, and he held this man's wrist, and he's a big guy, the one that got healed. Mike's a pretty big guy, too. But he was, he was holding his wrist like this, and he said, you can't close your eyes, you gotta look me in the eye. <laughs> and as the soldier's telling the story, he's like, I'm a pretty big guy, I think I could take him. But, you know, because that panic was starting to set in from the trauma. And Mike said, no, I'm not going to let you go until you look me in the eye. Because wow. <laughs> he knows the calling he has, and he knows the anointing that's on his life. And look, you know, we, we, we believe by faith. We're going to talk about that today, that just shall live by faith. And yes, it's important to live, you know, in alignment with the rules of God. We get blessed through obedience. But look, you don't earn the right to be healed, right? God loves you, and... and he wants to just move mightily in all of our lives. So good to see you. Those of you that I can recognize uh, with the mask on, getting better at this. <laughs> We're uh, going to launch into the Word, and I asked Carolyn McCombs if she'd help um, a little bit. Just in a couple minutes, I'll ask her to come up here with me. But uh, the, the Word that the Lord gave me for this week was the justice of Jesus, and then it evolved in my, as I meditated on the Word, into the eternal justice of Jesus because um, that's a big word in our culture today. It's always been a big word for America, uh, it, justice. And, and that's what I like about this picture uh, of the blindfold and the scales and the need for evidence and the need for us to have a fair system. And, and we're that amazing country that says you are innocent until proven guilty. That is a whole new idea that didn't exist before. It doesn't usually, that would never exist under a dictator because you don't have a lot of rights in a dictatorship. But then we can escalate our understanding to the justice of Jesus. It's at a whole other level. And it's similar to what Tim was saying earlier, is that if, um, if, we're, if it's not sanctified by the Lord, justice can be very vengeful. And that causes the scales to keep tipping back and forth between, I have to repay this debt. I, I suffered violence, so I have to give violence. And we know, <clears throat> excuse me, we know what Jesus said about that, right? If you're going to live by the sword, what? You're going to die by the sword. So in order for justice to be effective in the, in the eternal Jesus model, forgiveness is really key. But that doesn't mean that there are not gross in inequities in the world. There's a lot of unfairness in the world, okay? And that's because of sin, okay? And it could be that the sin in the hearts of the people with power leverage that power to take advantage of other people. And over and over in the Old Testament, God says, I hate injustice. I hate injustice. When Paul was debating with the, with the early church leaders about who could be a Christian, he was saying, it's not about being a Jew. It's not about being circumcised. It's about having faith in Jesus. And that's it. And that's what the whole Reformation was about. The just shall live by faith, not following a bunch of rules. It's not our ability to follow. The rules are great. We should follow them, yes, but that doesn't earn us our salvation, okay? So that's what I want to try to focus on, but also keep in front of you that as a church, we can't just sit by and say what a terrible problem that is. We have to also answer, what are we doing about it? What's the vision of the church? What has God showed you to help that change so that 20 years from now, you can look back on this region and say, wow, after that church came in, this shifted. They brought people in to do deliverance. They brought people in to do trauma healing. They, they helped fund the, the uh, crisis pregnancy center that we already talked about today with Lisa. There's five locations in the state of New Jersey where women can go and 
and receive counsel about whether or not they should receive an abortion or not. Now, you could just stand outside an abortion clinic and scream at the people going in, couldn't you? But what about offering them an alternative? What about trying to love them into the kingdom instead of shame them? Which way would Jesus do it? Right, we know, what he, we know what Jesus would do. But that kind of eternal Jesus justice takes a lot of steps and a lot of commitment and a lot of love. So we want to have ministries that you can get your hands dirty in, if I could say it that way, right? Where you could volunteer and you could actually go there. Because as good as it is to write a check to a, to a cause that's wonderful to help people financially, something happens in you when you actually go there in person and you look at the people. Or like we've been doing this food pantry now down in Raritan called Feeding Hands. And Tuesdays, several volunteers have been going from the church. And I think you've probably heard David Torres talked about how he was able to pray with 100 people that were all receiving the, the food as they were coming through the lines. He would just say, hey, can, can we pray for you? And nobody said no. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Because if they are in that line, that means that they qualify to need help, and people that need help want prayer, don't they? Well, there's a lot of people in our area here that need help. Don't you agree with that? I hope you do. So there's a lot of things we could do, but we want to do what, what we feel the Lord is saying for us specifically to do. Um, I was looking up in the balcony, and there's a ministry to Brazil that we help support. Just stand up for a second, okay? That's Sonia and Dan Kenna up there, just so people can ask you questions if you if you are, aren't sure about what to do. But that's where Sonia is from. That's where Dan met Sonia when he was working down in Brazil. And they started, uh, they built a, a building, a home for young people down there that, that they were ministering to, right? That's just the grace of God that in what would have otherwise been a very poor village. Now, you and I may never get to go there. Maybe you will, but if we don't, it doesn't mean we still aren't contributing to what's going on there. And it's the Lord only. That's the only reason that that would happen is it because of the Lord. So what's our position on justice as a church? It's got to be the justice of Jesus, which means there has to be forgiveness involved and there has to be an ability for redemption. <laughs> right? And this is my challenge to all of us is that one of the really glaring facts about our culture, but just not American culture, the whole world, is that the technology involvement in our daily lives is becoming overwhelming, isn't it? Yeah, now that you could say, well, that's making us more efficient. Maybe. But the demand to get more work done is also increasing, isn't it? I mean, I, I hate to use these old-fashioned words like secretary, but when I first went into corporate America 35 years ago, executives had a secretary. What would that be called today? <laughs> Administrative assistant. You know, like there's, a, there's much nicer words than that than that secretary, right? But they didn't mean anything by it. They just, whatever they did. But listen, now you have an iPhone. <laughs> you don't have an executive assistant and you're never supposed to turn the iPhone off. Right? It's like 24-7 that you're, they're, you're expected to respond, at least in the world I live in. And here's the thing they say to you. Oh, you can't meet the obligation of this job? That's okay. We have other people that are willing to do this. So I put this pressure on you that you've got to live this insane pace. And look, it goes all the way down to what used to be the jobs that you could do when you were in high school, right? You could, be, you could check food out at the grocery store. You could stock shelves in the back. Those jobs are going away fast. And even the ones that are there require you to know how to use a computer because you can't even ring the food through anymore because it's all on scanners. And, and, and you have to just think of the people that don't have the same ability that we have to adjust with the times. And you have to say, that's what the church is supposed to be here for. We're supposed to stand in the gap between poor kids in Brazil or people down at the Raritan Circle that have fallen on hard times or a young girl who's pregnant and going into a crisis pregnancy center, probably scared out of her wits, not knowing what's going to happen. And this is where we interface the kingdom of God with the kingdom of the world. And we say, this is different. And they might look at you and say, well, why would you do this? And you hopefully would say, because God did it for me. Right. The same way he forgave me, I'm willing to stand in the gap and help other people move forward. Because, But for the grace of God, I'm going to need help again. And I'm sure glad that other people will be around to do that with me. 
And the first verse I looked at was right here in Revelation 22, 17. It says, whosoever will. Don't you like that one? Whosoever will. If you're breathing, you qualify. You don't have to show us your resume. You don't have to give us any of your background information. The thief on the cross next to Jesus did not have a lot of time left to live. And yet he said, Lord, remember me. And Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Showing us that we should not overcomplicate this thing. And that if we, I really feel the strong leading of the Lord to say, I can offer you ministries to work with that we've vetted and that we trust, that we know and that we're supporting to make it easier for you than just going out and finding your own thing. But you're not restricted to just use the ones that we're talking about. But those are the people that are on the front lines. And life is difficult. So it's not like you have all this free time, but sometimes it's just an hour or two and, you know, we say it over and over again, the people that serve are just as blessed as the ones who are receiving the food at the food pantry. You go there, and because you're extending yourself on behalf of the poor, which is what the Lord said, that's right in the Bible, because you're doing what he did, he came down, and he extended himself on our behalf, so now we are operating in that opposite spirit of the world. We're being generous when we don't have to be. We're being generous to people who don't quote unquote deserve it. They didn't earn the right. Well, neither did we. That's why the eternal justice of Jesus has to have forgiveness. There's no cancel culture in the kingdom of God. <laughs> All right? I'm not going to use a lot of phrases in, that are in the culture today, but I'm sure glad there wasn't a cancel culture because I would have been kept out of the kingdom of God. He accepted me. And out of my gratitude, I want to serve him the rest of my life because I don't think I'd still be alive if I hadn't gotten saved. So I'm going to ask Carolyn if she'll come up now. And uh, I'm just, I want you to understand a little bit more about her role in the ministry that we help support that she founded, but also that she's an elder here in our church, as was Lisa Melillo, who spoke earlier. And Lisa's on the board of uh, First Choice. So... You know, we're talking to people who are very involved in the ministries that we're supporting. And in this case, in Carolyn's case, the founder of the ministry that we're supporting, which is called the Family Success Center, but it's called the New Destiny Family Success Center, which I love. That's a very inspired name that you gave. So, uh, that the Lord gave you. Sorry. Let me give you this microphone. And say hi to Carolyn McCombs. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Pastor. Um, you know, as, as Pastor was sharing, even though I am, you know, the founder of a ministry, God keeps up in the, the, the level of commitment. So yesterday I had the experience of going to the office. This is a long story. I don't even want to talk about it. But we were supposed to talk. We yesterday. were supposed to talk. So the first email said, I'm, I'm going to be busy until 2. <laughs> then I'm going to be busy until 5.30. And this is turning into a bigger project than I thought. I said, don't worry. Holy Spirit will take it. So I arrived at my office it's somewhere around 4.30 in the afternoon. This is downtown Patterson. Um, we've had an issue of homeless people sleeping. And the group keeps changing. And so this time, the group of people who are sleeping outside our doors are different from the people who slept outside our doors three or four months ago. So when I walk up, I've had the occasion to walk up, and every time I walk up, I feel like the compassion of Jesus comes on me. I walked up about two months ago, and there was a young woman there. She looked like she could be my daughter. And from what I've heard, she's been very violent. She's come after people with knives. And immediately when I saw her, I said, sweetie, how are you? She says, I'm OK. I said, I have to come into my office. I said, do you mind? Oh, no, no problem. I said, honey, I see you put stickers all over our window. Would you please take those off? She said, no problem. And she took every single sticker off. And I just felt like the Lord is getting my heart ready to begin to meet people where they are. Yeah, amen. And yesterday I walked up again, and it was an older woman sitting um, at, the, at the door. And I said, hello, how are you? She said, I'm, I'm okay. I said, I'm sorry, I, I have to get into the office. Do you mind? She said, not at all. 
And she stood up, and when she stood up, a quarter dropped on the ground. And I felt like the Lord stopped me in the moment, mm -hmm. but I was so distracted. Mm -hmm. I had so much going on, I couldn't grasp what the Lord was probably asking me to say or do. And I'm just like, you know, she picked up her quarter, and I was like, thank you very much, I went in. So this morning, I'm in prayer. And the Lord brought me to the Bible where um, Peter and, um, I, think, I think it was Peter and John, um, were walking by and there was a, a person that was begging alms. And when they walked by, he asked them for alms and they said, look, we don't have silver and gold. And they said, but look at us. <laughs> and I thought about what you just said, about, look at us. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. Right. And that man received his miracle. And I feel so much like that's where we are as a body of Christ. God is saying, I am your eyes. He says, look at the lonely, look at the lost, look at the homeless. Say, look at me. Look them in the eye. Just like um, um, Mr. Hutchins is doing. And say, in the name of Jesus, right. Get up and walk. In right. the name of Jesus, be healed. And I believe that's the boldness that's coming on us in this hour as we begin to trust God and seek him for what it is he's, he's calling us to do. Amen. Right. No, stay. That's just good. Um, so, look, most of us probably are not asking people to move away from the front of the door when we go in to work in the morning, okay? So this was a voluntary thing that Carolyn knew the Lord was showing her to do. And it's not exactly the safest place, right? And you know, we, we had one intern that was working there for a while. I think it was the first day she was on the job. There was a shooting a block away. Okay, like you know, it's not every day, thankfully. But wouldn't you think it would take a lot of courage to be able to do that when Carolyn had a, a, a background of being an executive? She has an MBA. She you was know, working in, in big corporations, and yet there's a calling that comes on us to say, "No, I know what God told me to do." And I'm going to go do this, and I'm going to pray for the people that come around and support me, but my eye is on the prize of what he asked me to do. And he asked me to name it New Destiny. Like, if that's not a Jesus justice thing, what is? Right? You're going to have a new destiny. Every time I say the name of the ministry, I'm reminding myself that God has a new destiny for me. And it's a family success center. So the things that the people that are near this ministry or need the ministry are being taught tools to know how a healthy family should function. Anybody here want to volunteer for that? Well, we did have guys go in yes. and, uh, and... The and, Fatherhood and, Initiative. The Fatherhood Initiative, yeah, where yeah. men from our Corey, church went Corey down and Jones. spoke. Yeah. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Um, and, and just to that point, Pastor, even now more, we need men who are fathers to mentor men who have never seen a model of what father is. And um, the other day I had an, a conversation with someone in the state of New Jersey, he's in an office in the state, and I said, yeah, you know, I have this vision to bring a fatherhood program to our city. And I said, I got some seed money for it. And I told him how much I got, he's like, oh, no, no, no. He said, no, 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 you need way more money than that. <laughs> You're like, yes. And, yes. <laughs> but what I know is men need men to model how to be fathers. Right. If you've never seen a father, how would you know? But as we as uh, a people of God model the father, we lead them to the father right. who is the ultimate father. Right. So now we just say the justice of the eternal justice of Jesus is a little different than what we've been hearing about so much in the news is because we're not even talking about politics now. We're just talking about a need that's here. And we're the church. And we had a need and we came into the church and people opened their arms and received us and helped us. I hope that's true for all of you. Amen. Right? But in the broken state we were in, somebody looked at us and said, God loves you. Even though you didn't even feel lovable yourself. And now, like, to just stand before the Lord one day and say, you live during one of the biggest crises in, in, in the country's history. People are out of work. The economy's disrupted. And who's being left behind are the most vulnerable people. They don't have the bandwidth at home. They don't have the laptop. They can't do Zoom calls. They don't even know how to use a computer to do a Zoom call. Something that we take so for granted that we 
we joke around that somebody froze a little bit because they didn't have a strong enough connection. I go to work, I have eight screens around me. And they're all being used. And I'm thinking like, what the heck happened? Like this is, a, this is almost required on everybody's job now to be so technical, technically savvy. And if, and, you know, because I was on the board of Carolyn's ministry, I got to learn a lot more about it than most people probably would. And I won't go into detail uh, or disclose anything confidential, but I was not aware of how difficult it is for an inner city child who doesn't have both parents in the house to keep even with other students in, in the school. Because here's one that I just had never thought about. They're in the summers. Both of my parents were home. I had a great family. I was supported in the things that I wanted to do. And we spent summers together and we would do things. We'd go on vacation together. And I was actually growing over the summer through my experiences. Carolyn would say to me, oh no, our kids are falling further behind during the summer. So because they're not using what they were taught in school and they're basically just idle during the whole three summer months, they come back to school and they forgot a lot of what they already learned. So now the other kids didn't, the other kids were being supported and now the, the gap just keeps getting bigger. I'm not talking about political solutions now because we could disagree all day long about what's the right way to solve the problem. What I am saying is we can't say we're not gonna try to help the problem. We have to do something, right? Like that's the urgency that we have that we, we're going to stand before him someday, and, and he's going to say there was all these needs, like, right at your door, and all you did was keep having, you know, church services. I love church services. I hope you're glad about that. But that's a piece of what we do as we serve the Lord, right? But we should really be encouraging one another and spurring one another on. I love that expression, right? That's a New Testament quote, that we spur one another on to good works, not because we're earning our salvation by good works. It's so... That's a juvenile way of looking at that whole topic, right? We didn't earn our way in, but now that we're in, there should be a fire shut up in our bones to want to share with the world this good thing that the Lord did for us. And maybe you're not the greatest street evangelist, but anybody can take cans of food and put them in a bag. You don't have to know Romans chapter 8 for that one. I want you to know Romans chapter 8, but see, we can be doing redemptive things in the culture not tied to any political motivation, tied to the eternal justice of Jesus. And he doesn't want one person to perish. Somebody, can you mind staying up for a little bit longer? Because again, like I'm not on the front lines every day like Carolyn is. So there's many examples that, that she can give. And I, if you've been in the church, maybe what was it, six or seven years ago when Lourdes came? Yeah. And uh, this was a person that had been homeless. You could just give a quick yeah. Uh, story. So um, when I met Lourdes, um, she was just coming out of a shelter for the, uh, domestic violence and she had uh, two teenage sons and twin daughters. And what had happened was that they were, in, they ended up being put in a high school in Patterson, her sons, um, and they were bullied really badly. Um, and as a result, we ended up connecting them with some resources and got them the help they needed until her sons, you know, they, they persevered and hopefully they're somewhere doing well. But at the end of the day, Lourdes was in need of work, but she came in as a volunteer to help out because she was so pleased with the, the support we'd given her. And um, eventually we hired her as a family partner, i.e. someone who would speak to other moms who might be in the same situation of domestic violence or whatever the need was. Um, and she excelled, um, did extremely well. Um, and in the process, she got a call from her dad in, in uh, Puerto Rico that someone had come to visit um, who was actually not come to visit. He'd gone to visit because he was a physician who was working on his, um, he was a surgeon, heart surgeon. So he's dealing with his issues of her father's heart. Long story short, that gentleman ends up being a person that tried to date her when they were in high school, who her father kicked out the house. <laughs> um, so long story short, he connected them, and they started talking. And before you knew it, that flame was revived. She ended up going back to Puerto Rico, getting married, and lives on some nice home on the beach in Puerto Rico. But the Why? Because <laughs> somebody opened the door 
and said, I'm going to show up every day. I don't know when this is going to go right or wrong, but I just know I'm going to do my part. And we're going to open the door and allow people to come in. She went from being homeless to basically being your second in command. Yes, she did. There was so much talent in this person that was being buried under all the problems that she was facing. But if somebody would just give a chance, oh my God, if that's not the biblical way that the Lord wants us to interact with people, that doesn't mean you're naive. You know, Carolyn, you've heard every way that people try to game the system. Um, you know, but that's okay. You know, that's the only way they know how to play the game. But now they're coming into a place that, yes, it's it's a community service center, but it's also based on biblical values. Exactly. And, and that shows to the rest and of the world. so important what you're saying, Pastor, because we meet people all the time. And this is the reality. They don't want us preaching Jesus to them. They have, they've come, they have a need, but this is how they walk away. I felt love. And then that's the opportunity when we say, yes, that's the way Jesus uses us. So that's a much more effective witness than me coming and, you know, giving somebody a Bible that they didn't ask for, but showing the love. And when they walk away, they say, that place, New Destiny, when I walked in there, the love I felt, that's a testimony. Mm To the, to the power of God in action. I want to just share a scripture here, Pastor, Please. that um, um, the Lord just has been burning in me. It's from, um, the, from um, Ephesians 1. And I'm going to read a little bit. It's from the Passion Translation. Through our union with Christ, we too have been claimed by God as his own inheritance. Before we were even born, he gave us our destiny. That we would fulfill the plan of God who always accomplishes every purpose and plan in his heart. Mm -hmm. That's the word of the Lord for all of us. So we all have a destiny. God has already designed a plan. We are the solution to these issues. Um, One of the things Pastor mentioned was summer learning loss. We're way beyond that now. We have had a year of learning loss with, these, with our children. So our children are probably going to emerge from this pandemic at least two to three years behind because they were already behind a year, some of them, before the pandemic. And so I'm just saying, Lord, how, how can we be, how can I be a solution? I believe God is going to deposit in the body of Christ solutions and strategies that are going to help our children overcome these barriers. And I just, I just applaud anybody who's pressing it in prayer in that way. I guarantee you God is going to answer that prayer. Yeah, it's a big need right now. Can you just stay a little longer? Yeah. Can you guys show that video that I gave you? Because the Lord gave, it gives me pictures sometimes about what he's trying to impress upon me. And, and this one really kind of hit home kind of bright but you remember this ride when you were down at the amusement park you're standing up against a wall and it starts spinning so they're putting their arms out it's starting to spin and the bottom the bottom's dropping see that one kid and what's holding them in force it's centrifugal force it's the spinning that's going on. And now we see she's falling. And that means it's, start, it's stopping. It's, it's slowing down. And now the force of that thing that was holding them is diminishing. So at different rates, they're getting their feet back on the ground again. That long girl still stuck up there. <laughs> and then they're like, mm, can I venture out? I don't know. And then boom, she gets pulled back again. <laughs> and this kid with the arms up in the air, it's like, eventually it all wears off. Thank you, that's it, that, that made the point. So how does this apply? <laughs> that's what's been going on with us, a big swirl and you get pinned into position and you get like obsessed by having to look at the next thing and the next website and we're, we're spending more time looking at things than the Bible. Not a good plan, 
okay? Yes, very good plan to be aware of what's going on, but don't allow your emotions to do what was happening to them in that picture, right? We can't allow ourselves to get pinned into submission to some thought process, whether it's fear, you know, all the different ways the enemy's tried to attack us. And don't forget that for a year now, we have not had a normal way of living. Never mind just church services, but not being able to go and get closure at a funeral. There's just so many ways it's impacted our lives. I was so grateful just to get to see Jim McCourt before he passed, because even there, like we wanted to announce the service, we wanted to let everybody know, but the, the funeral parlor said, oh no, all you can do is come in, pay your respects, and then you have to leave. Jesus. Right, I know. Like, it's just really, this picture I hope stays in your mind. Fight against that force that's trying to pin you in that swirl of whatever the thing is that's trying to consume you and, and just do what the Lord would ask us to do is just go into that sanctuary, go into that presence. But okay, so obviously Carolyn's black, I'm white. We grew up, we didn't really know each other that well, but we ended up going to the same high school and lived in the same town, found out about the other, each other's ministries through John and Cheryl Price, right? And, and there's just been a connection here of I'm looking at the uh, white collar world of Wall Street and she's looking after being in a corporate job at, at right on the, on the front lines of the battle. And there's something we can both bring to the table that will help the bigger cause, okay? Because the people that I work with want to help ministries like Carolyn's but might not know about it or might not have a, a vetting process to know if it's legit or not. But if they trust me, which I hope they do, then they would say, oh, yeah, I would like to learn more about that. Uh, one other thing, the lady that runs the uh, food pantry, it's called Feeding Hands, as I mentioned, they're looking for um, another location closer to here than Raritan. And when we were talking about the needs that they had, she said almost identical words, and you didn't know this, but she said almost the identical words. It's like, what we don't want is them to feel like they're being processed. We want them to get out of their car, come in, do an intake questionnaire, ask some questions, and ask if we can pray for them because they already feel like another number when they go to these other places. Who's gonna have the eternal justice of Jesus as a Christian and say, no, look, we don't think less of you because you need help, because we all need help. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but that eternal justice said, I'll take your penalty, and you can come in under the substitutionary work that I'll do for you, and now we are the body of Christ. Meaning, we're his body. We're moving around as his body. He's not here, but we are. So we can touch things through his cause. And, and because, not because we're trying to earn brownie points. It's to say, no, what Carolyn said, almost exactly the same words Lois Bennett, who's the founder of Feeding Hands, said, is that they've got to feel loved. And they'll sit here and tell us when they come here, they're like, oh, we really like coming here because the other places, we have to wait in line outside in the cold and wait for our turn, and then they just basically shove something out the door and give us a bag and tell us to get out of the way, to let the next person come. Not us, church, right? And is it really that the root cause is that people just want to feel dignity and humanity shouldn't pull rank on each other, but in, in the secular world, it happens all the time because they don't understand the justice of Jesus or, or this idea that everybody is priceless in the eyes of God. Politics aside, how to solve the problem is what the politicians do. That the problem exists is something we have to know and then decide what we want to do about it. it I don't personally think the answer could be nothing. Maybe you do. That's okay. I'm not putting a guilt trip on anybody. I'm just saying this is what the Lord's been stirring me with and, and why I wanted Carolyn to be up here so you know who one of the people that we're talking about. But, um, and also, like, we could just feel that there's a connection with this Feeding Hands ministry and others because it's really tough out there right now. There's a lot of really hurting people. The food pantries are double the normal amount of people that are trying to get help. And they don't, they're shutting their doors because they can't meet the need. And look, uh, again, I've made that point enough. Um, any, any closing comments? Because I want to just give a couple of verses sure. before I close. Um, just as you were saying that, Pastor, we, like I said, we meet many people in many walks of life. And to the point you were making, this woman that we had a conversation with last week was someone that came in 
at the, at the lowest of low. She was pregnant, um, she was looking for resources, you know, and she said to me, she said, when I walked in, you guys didn't just give me the stuff and put me out. She said, you kept calling me back. Right. How, how else can we help you? Can we connect you with someone? And so as a result, she felt welcomed. Mm -hmm. She felt so welcomed after a couple of encounters with us. She says, I'm coming out with you guys to give the diapers there you go. away. There you go. So she ended up coming to help us give out the diapers that she was once a recipient of. <laughs> and then we had um, a job opening. And just on a whim, we said, well, what about this young lady? <laughs> and we said, well, we'll just give her a call. She may not even be qualified. We call her up only to find out she graduated from John Jay College with a BA degree in criminology and social work. There you go. Hidden gem. Can't make this up. Can't make it up. Can't make this up. And so here she comes back to us a seed that we planted, now she says, and now I want to come in and I want to bless everyone Amen. that I meet, just like you guys bless Blessed me. Blessed to be a blessing. <laughs> All right, so two things I like to do. Um, Dan and Sonia, if you could stand up too, and we, we also support another ministry by Mona Patel down in New Brunswick. Uh, this is uh, New Destiny Family Success Center. Lisa, if you could stand also. Uh, Mona's not here. Just stay out up here for a minute too, oh. uh, one, one more minute, because I want all of us to pray for them, because they're on the front lines. But then I want Carolyn, because she's got the mic, to release that passion in our heart to just keep our eyes open and our ears open. So please stretch your hand towards the people that are standing. Lord, we just thank you for the commitment that it takes. So many hundreds of hours of volunteer time that get put in. And we wonder sometimes, are we really getting the return on the investment? But it's a kingdom investment. And as you gave into us, Lord, we want to give back into those that are in need. And we understand that we're here for such a time as this right now, that there's a tremendous need all around us. And we refuse to just sit by idly and say there's nothing we can do because we know there's much that can be done. So help these leaders that are standing, Lord, have a clear vision on how you want them to move forward. And help us to receive the impartation. Go ahead, Carol, just pray for us to, so to be Father, able to receive. Just, just use I the just, microphone. Oh. Okay. Father, I thank you. I thank you, Lord God, that your flame, your flame is alive in us. And Lord God, that your passion lives in us. And I thank you, Father, for the living water that you gave us, just like you gave the woman at the well. And you said to her, if you drink from Jacob's well, you'll be thirsty again and again. But if anyone drinks the living water I give them, they will never thirst again and will be forever satisfied. For when you drink the water I give you, it becomes a gushing fountain of the Holy Spirit, springing up and flooding you with endless life. Father, I release endless life. I release endless life. I release streams of living water coming forth out of our bellies that gives life to everyone we meet. Father, I release your love. I release, Father, the fire of Holy Ghost. Lord God, that we would be spurred on, that we would not grow weary and well-doing, but we will awaken, oh God. We will awaken to your call and we will arise and do and be all that you've called us to be and do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I'll just give you a little two verses and then we'll close up. Um, uh, Carolyn actually invited this lady, Lourdes, to come to our church and give the testimony before she was moving back to Puerto Rico. And she came to thank us, and I never forgot that because she, you know, she was crying. She's saying, look, you know, I was homeless. I, I was part of the working poor. I was homeless, and I knocked on the door of this um, ministry, and here it is a couple years later, and I'm going back to marry the guy I knew in high school and live in, in a beautiful home like talk about redemption all because somebody had the door open when I knocked sounds a little scriptural doesn't it so Jesus said let me in open the door I'm knocking let me in and everybody's gonna have their own way of, of um, understanding what the best way to do something is prayer certainly helps right but also, 
making some effort too. I, I would just really encourage you to pray and ask the Lord because you have a zone where you're most effective that's different than the rest of us. So you really want to find that zone that could allow you to flourish in the thing that you're working on. And I actually had gone to the Family Success Center as one of the board members when they were dedicating the new space at the time. It's where they are now, but it was new to them then. And there were some pretty high-level dignitaries there. One was the mayor, who was not very popular with this crowd, I can tell you. So all the people that were, um, what would you say, clients of the Family Success Center were there to cheer on the fact that there was this new building. And they introduce the mayor, and it's like, <laughs> one of these. And then they introduce Lourdes, and the whole place goes crazy, right? Because she was the living example of what they all hoped to be able to see the progress. They need a ray of hope. And if the church isn't giving them that, oh man, we are dropping the ball, okay? So what else is different about the justice of Jesus? The eternal justice of Jesus is that he doesn't ask us to point fingers at other people first. He asks us to look in the mirror first. And not everybody likes that, right? Because if you're married, you know it's really easy to shift the blame of the thing you're talking about to your spouse. Come on, I do marriage counseling. Don't be uh, holding out on me here. They call that blame shifting. Well, if she would just do this, no, no. Like, look in the mirror, and what can you be working on? And all the women said, amen. <laughs> well, if you would just do this, it's not about the nail. You've seen that. I hope you've seen that video. <laughs> so we have to look in the mirror. And, and I would say that starts with the morning altar. Right? That's your place of prayer where you get alone with God. And I'm going to highly, highly recommend you do it first thing in the morning because that's setting your whole day. And if you start out thinking about God and asking him to be with you every second of every minute of every hour of the day, your chances go up for success in the kingdom. If you leave without praying, you're victim to your flesh and your emotions and you get caught up in that spin of that swirl. And now all of a sudden, before you know it, your emotions have you pinned against the wall and you don't have your feet on the ground. So prayer is so key. And, and don't think of it as bringing a list to God, if I can help you on that one, for me at least. It was, no, no, I'm not bringing a list to God. My list starts with help. <laughs> we can all pray that one. And if you say, help, what's wrong with me, God? He'll say, oh, glad you're asking. I'm happy to show you. That's part of looking in the mirror. And if we know that he loves us, Whatever he tells us is going to be good for us. Just like any good mother or father would do for their child, right? So these are just some verses from the message translation. You probably know the verse if you've been a Christian any length of time, where it says, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, right? That's from this Psalm 19. And I put win the war for your altar because I want to try to burn that in, that there's a competition between good and evil for your altar. And, and the betrayal that Tim was talking about is so kind of uh, universally a difficult thing to deal with because we trust people and then we get betrayed and we're angry not just with them, but we're angry with ourselves because we allowed it to happen to us and we should have known better. And you look at yourself in the mirror and say, you're such a loser that you could let that happen to you. And God's saying, no, no, I'm not saying that about you. So you shouldn't be saying about you what he's not saying about you. Let it all agree. But I, I would think with the amount of distractions that are available to us today that we don't all have this really healthy morning altar. I want you to win the war for the altar, is what I'm saying. You will flourish as a Christian at a higher degree if you start your day giving him the first minutes of the first hours of your day in prayer. And whatever that means, shift your schedule if you have to. Start on your knees. And if you can do communion, that's a great thing to do. Let that be the first thing you do. Start with communion. I want to commune with you today, Lord. Not real big, complicated religious ritual. It's just acknowledging. Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and that brought sin into the world. I'm eating your flesh and blood here represented, Lord, not the real thing, but I'm going to prove that I'm going to reverse their bad decision and say that I need your knowledge of good and evil, not mine. So you're reproducing a meal to reverse the curse of that sin that they brought into the world. And here he says, maybe I jumped 
Yeah, there it is. This is verse 11. God's word warns us of danger and directs us to hidden treasure. You see how this girl lured us at, at Family Success Center was a hidden treasure. And because Carolyn's there opening up every day, let me tell you, if I had to go to work every day and know that I was going to have to move homeless people aside from my front door, that would be a little discouraging to me. But that's who we're here for, right? That's, that's the purpose of the ministry. But if you're not seeing much results or the grants are getting turned down or whatever's happening to cause you, you need an offset. You need a reminder. And we did a video with Carolyn to help her promote one of the fundraisers she was doing. And the lady that was doing it, uh, doing the filming was a friend of mine from New York who wasn't a Christian and who was really impressed. And they were doing the interview and Carolyn was behind her desk. And this lady said to Carolyn, what makes you get up and come every day? Like, what, what drives you to keep coming back here? And I know she wasn't expecting that question. <laughs> it's Jehovah Sneaky, strikes again. And she went to answer, and all she did was cry. And that said volumes, right? Like, I've got a burden for these people. I, this is who God has called me. This is my tribe. These are the people that I'm going to minister to. So there's no question about whether I should or shouldn't be here. I know I should be here. Is it easy to get discouraged? Yeah. But then you get stories like the one we said today. And it's like, yep, that's it. I'm going to open the doors again. And I'm just going to show up. I'm going to do my part. I'll be here. And never know who that hidden gem is going to be. That's what he said. He directs us to hidden treasure. God's word warns us of all the danger of the world, but he'll direct us to hidden treasure. Otherwise, how will we find our way? Or know when we play the fool. It's a great morning prayer. Clean the slate, God, so that we can start the day fresh. Keep me from stupid sins. That's, that's the message Bible, right? He's just getting right to the point. From thinking that I can take over your work. Guilty. I don't need to pray. I know what to do. Ugh. That's pride. That goes right back to the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. No, I don't know what to do as good as you do. So I'm submitting myself to you and I'm not going to take over your work. Then I can start this day sun washed, scrubbed clean of grime and sin. These are the words of my mouth. These are what I chew on and pray. Accept them when I place them on the morning altar. That's the best picture I can give you, right? The words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord. Start your day in prayer. If you normally get up at 6.05, get up at 6 o'clock. You know, I don't know. Whatever it is, this is too important not to make this a daily discipline. And once you start seeing how your day goes better, because you're, you're asking and you're inviting him in and you're getting scriptures and words and, and people, you start getting a prompt to call somebody. That's the Holy Spirit telling you, this person needs to hear from you. Give them a call. Don't battle it around in your brain. Just do it. And you start to recognize his voice. These are the words that I chew on and pray. Accept them when I place them on the morning altar. Oh God, my altar rock. God, the priests of my altar. Let's stand. I love this language. My altar rock and the priests of my altar. And you know, you probably heard me say, this is not a stage. This is an altar. We're not here to perform the way you would perform on a stage. We're here to minister. And it can start to lose some of its value. But if you know anything about the Old Testament altar, they were bringing valuable things there to die. You couldn't just bring a second-hand, broken-legged sheep, right? You brought the best, and you were saying, Lord, I give it to you. I'm giving you my best because you gave me your best. You kept me alive. You kept me safe. You got me out of Egypt, and I don't want to forget that that's where my root system is. So my altar rock is the Lord in the morning, and there's something about starting there in the day that, that prompts you to want to listen to worship music all day prompts you to want to stop and, and take a break and walk outside and just pray on a nice day and, and look up at the Lord and say, just I'm checking in, Lord, like frustrated over that last phone call I just had, but I don't want to be that kid that's stuck on that loop, being held to the wall by my emotions. I want to guard my heart and I want to know that I'm following after what you say to do. I'm telling you, this, 
probably it sounds like a pretty basic message, but I think it's one of the greatest ways for you to grow as a Christian. It's just win the war for your altar. All right. Would you lift your hands? I just want to pray for you. Lord, we're just so grateful for every person that's here today, every person that's watching. Thank you for Carolyn and her transparency to come up here and help us understand what's going on in, in the New Destiny Family Success Center. But also, Lord, we just ask you to, to just sensitize our hearts to the needs of the people that are around us and not to judge them and not to say, well, they're just lazy. They should just get a job. Lord, that's an insult to you. Because these hurting people don't want to be hurting. But you've got us here as this intermediary, this conduit between kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of the earth. And Lord, politics aside, we ask you to just make us aware of how we can help meet these needs and bring people to you. And then when they come to know you, everything else seems to fall in place behind it. So Lord, we just say, yes, we are your ambassadors today, going to work on your behalf. And we want to be those people that win the war for our altar every day in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. amen. I know people still like to get prayer. We're, we're being very good about it. We're, we're staying our distance apart, but you don't have to run out. If you'd like to get prayer, you might have to wait a minute for people to become available, but please know that we'll make it work without getting arrested. <laughs> Love you all.